Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast on the classical world, the ancient world, classical education, put on by three guys who like that stuff. Yep. And that's our intro for today. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great intro. Thanks. I just wanna, of all of our intros, that might be the most intro of them all. It's very it's succinct. It yeah. got to the point. Uh, we like to talk about literature. We like to talk sometimes about theology, but we love to talk about uh, the classical world, education, how we learn things, uh, how human beings grow and develop and become good men and women. Mm. And today, AJ is, I think, talking about some kind of dog. Yeah. Yeah, Beowulf. Oh, a wolf. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he's talk- oh, um, talking it's, to it us. It's pr- predominantly found in bodies of water, the bay. <laughs> The bay, wolves? The, bay wolf? Yeah. the bay of wolves. The bay of wolves. The bay of wolves. That's terrifying. Yeah. I'm sorry, audience. That's such a bad <laughs> pun. Okay. I yeah. I'm talking about Beowulf today, and that's a. It's a book that I teach my ninth graders. So I've I've read through it a few times, and there's still there's still gaps in my knowledge. Right there, the Viking world is sort of a a deep thing to study. If you want to jump in there, I still haven't. I still intend to read about all of the North mythology and all that stuff. But I I do know a little bit about Beowulf, and so I'm going to be walking us through the basics of the book. It might have been intimidating to you in school. It, it was for me. It shouldn't be. It's, no. it, the translations that have come out recently make it really easy. It's a great story. Uh, it's really simple. Um, so first, I want to paint sort of the picture of where you would have heard this tale, right? Is, is that a glass of mead you were drinking in yes. front of you? <laughs> it's the only way to talk about Beowulf. Yeah. No, because a... mead is gross. No. <laughs> <laughs> have you guys ever had You don't mead? like fermented no. honey water? Is no, it it's is? gross. Yeah, it sounds it's, really gross. It's way too sweet for me. Maybe I just had sweet mead. Sweet mead. <laughs> and there's, sweet mead, like, brah. So honey with sugar? With, <laughs> yeah, that sounds even worse. I've never had mead before. Me neither. That's yeah, not my favorite. Mm-hmm. Okay. You... Would, were probably a noble or a wealthy person, and you would be invited to a castle or a wealthy nobleman, nobleman's home. You would wear your finest clothing. You would be with the finest, smartest people. They would all be educated. You would be away from the cares of, and worries of the world. You're you describing be, my life. <laughs> I was going to say. Isn't that what this podcast is? Yeah. feasted and entertained, mm-hmm. and the entertainment part is where you would hear the story. Okay. A guy would get up in front of everybody, usually with a lute or lyre, and then he would sit and play for you this tale play, and sort of play, sing it. Sing? Wait, really? Sing? Yeah. Most of the old epics were sung. So you like would the come, whole thing? Yeah, the whole... He would sit down and he would have food and drink right, right <laughs> at his right-hand side in case he got hungry or thirsty because it was a long thing. Yeah. But he was someone that had worked hard. He had put together this tale and then he would sing it to you <laughs> as a noble person. Do we have any like records of what kind of music would have been played or do we sort of even... Do, do, have people hypothesized like what that music would have sounded like for death metal probably <laughs> <laughs> so screamed Lots Beowulf of, was just screamo it's, it's like, yeah it's not the screamo <laughs> your hair is everywhere uh, alright so you you would be sitting and hearing this tale and it now we kind of see parties generally as sometimes maybe a chore like you go and you don't necessarily want to dress up and get in your fancy clothes. I'm sorry, did you just say we see parties as a chore? Yes. It can sometimes be true. Because it's true. What do you what are you disagreeing with this? Are you really? Yes. You guys yeah. see like I mean if you out and, and partying as a chore? Not That's that different. kind of party, but yeah. but like fancy parties. Right. You have to put on a tux, you gotta put on a black tie, you have to go to this thing. You get to put on a tux. <laughs> and and that was the exact attitude of ancient man, right? This was you put on your good clothes to have the best time, right? It hmm. wasn't that the clothes were kind of stodgy and you had to do it and it was such a bummer. Like you did it because it was nice and it was, you put on your finery, everyone else put on their finery and it was, it was a great time. So you'd sit and you'd hear this tale and Beowulf, the, the action I think happened sometime in 500. I've also seen it said that it's hap- it, the action happened somewhere between 700 to a thousand. I'm pretty sure the action is somewhere in the 500s. Right, what, that's when the tale occurs. And what country are we talking about? Who is so Beowulf was a modern what? Like where, where would he be? Where is he is Sweden he, and Denmark? Okay, so like Scandinavia. Yeah, they were they were the Danes. Gotcha. Is primarily where all this happened. So Beowulf was a Dane. Beowulf was a Yayet. Yayet. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. If, if you creates. read if you read the tale, tale it looks like Geat. G E A T. Ah. So he was a Yayat and he goes and visits the Danes, but we're not in the tale yet. So we, we date this tale because a few of the guys in the story are actually real fellas, oh. right? I think um, Finn is a guy that's mentioned here and he was a real guy. And then uh, Half Dane, we think, was a real person and he probably lived. We also think, I think, Hrothgar was probably a real guy. And you don't know who those people are yet, but, but because we know that these people probably existed, we can kind of date the tale. 
but Beowulf was not a real person. Uh, it's doubtful. Um, but, was, you know, we don't know. Was half Dane super short? Like half the size of yeah. a Dane? <laughs> half a Dane. <laughs> that was a unit of measurement back then, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, about half a Dane. Yeah, about half yeah. a Dane. Yeah. Uh, that was a full Dane. Um, so he... Man, you throw me off my, my tack here. Uh, yeah, so it was composed... Somewhere between 600 and 1,000. We have one manuscript. Even the dating of the manuscript is a little bit, you know, fought about. It's like 900 to 1,100 around there. But we only have a single copy hmm. compared with many other books from antiquity, right? Aristotle, Plato, sometimes we have more than one copy of those. We get like three to 10. The scriptures, we have like 5,000 different copies, but it's different pieces of the book all over the place. Yeah. At Beowulf, we have one. Huh. And I think it's in the British Museum. That's cool. Yeah, and so we don't know some of the pieces of the tale because there's a com complex tension between paganism and Christianity through the tale. We're not sure if there were some things added by the copyist, who was probably a monk, mm. to the original tale. So he got, this, bit pagan, of commentary. He got this pagan story, <laughs> and he Let put fix things this. in. They only fix this, and it's, <laughs> and it's like... But deep down, he knew he loved Christ. <laughs> but what well, does it feel like? That like is it? But um, I don't think. It, on? But that's the thing. I don't think it is. I think the person who wrote the tale was writing in a time when they were recently Christianized and mm. so recent that he still had sympathy for the pagan ancestors of the past. Right? He would say they were pagans. Yeah, but that was their way. Right? They didn't. They didn't know they had some trouble. And so there's there's this weird tension where sometimes you'll hear Beowulf speak Christian words, mm. and then sometimes he will do very pagan things or have pagan mm. attitudes. And mm. so there's this weird tension through the whole tale. Okay, the basics of the story. Here we go. So the scene opens, and it talks about the great, great ancestor of the Danes, shield sheafing or shield sheffing. And he is, he lives... And he gives birth to some kids. I think it's Beo and then Half Dane and then Hrothgar. I think Shield sheafing? Yeah. The man sounds like a verb. Because he's sheathing of he's probably whatever he, sheafing a shield well, means. They don't think Shield was a real guy. Uh, oh. Half Dane oh. was probably a real guy. But a wee little lad. <laughs> And then Beo. And then, well, not, Beowulf is not even part of this. So Beo is not the same as Beowulf. Yeah, Beo is a different guy. And uh, so the, one of the translations I have is actually by J.R.R. Tolkien. He was a huge Beowulf fan, and that will become even more evident how his Hobbit tale and Beowulf is connected <laughs> later in the podcast. But he he thinks that it could have been a mistake. It could have been a different oh. guy. It, there's there's a lot of different thought about who Beo exactly exactly was. Mm -hmm. Probably it was just a different guy. Okay. So there's shield sheafing, gives birth to Beo, gives birth to Halfdane. Halfdane has some kids, Harogar, Hrothgar, Halga, and a daughter who's unnamed. <laughs> Bummer. Yeah. Uh, and they they bury him. Oh. And if you're imagining where they put you on a boat and then shoot mm -hmm. and light the boat on fire, yeah. well, they didn't light it on oh. fire. Oh, they just let the boat go? piled up all his gold. Huh. And because he was an orphan coming from a, an unknown land, they sent him back out to sea, oh, an orphan. That's kind of cool. Right? And they're like, and nobody knows who gathered that hoard of gold. Mm. So somebody got really lucky and was like, hey, a boat, <laughs> and it's full of gold. Yeah. Yeah. And also a dead guy, yeah. which is a bummer. But Let's ignore him. Yeah, it's <laughs> get all the gold. gold. Or yeah. it just sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Probably that. I, I can't help but wonder if it was really hard to get it. Like, they had to wait for the just the right windy day. <laughs> Otherwise, it just ends up like two miles down, down shore. shore. <laughs> and there's one guy just sort of following Waiting it all the way. It. Yeah. yeah. And um, one farmer comes into town and he's like, buys all the beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it turns out Hrothgar eventually gets kingship. Mm -hmm. And Hrothgar is a good king. Oh. It says he wrecks mead benches. And what that oh, means. Oh, yeah, he does. <laughs> but that's a weird thing. It so well, I kind of have to now introduce you to the culture of the time. Good. So it was hard, dark, and difficult. Right? They're in Norway, mm -hmm. right? In Sweden. And it is. Place snowy. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, so Scandinavia. Yeah, yeah, Scandinavia. The, it's, it's dark, it's snowy, it's horrible, it's really hard to raise crops. It's good for raising kids and not much else, right? Ruddy, ruddy sons. And we they, northerners are that way. Yeah. Because there are not enough resources to go around, if you don't have something, the easiest way to get it is to go take it from somebody else. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? And then at the center of the culture is the hall. This is where the king lives. Often the guys will sleep here. There's business that goes on here at night. They will be feasted. They will come in communion. And the Kamitatus, or group of warriors, the retinue of the Lord, their job is to protect the Lord and fight for him. Hmm. The Lord's job is to, in return, protect them politically, give them land, food, money, protection, that sort of thing. And so there's sort of a 
a relationship here. We in America have a hard time thinking of a lord as anything except terrible. Right. Right? But that wasn't the case back then. They they often loved their lords. Mm. Their lords were the the bulwark, the anchor of the society. And they're the ones who would decide when to go to war and they would be leading the charges and then they would give out, if they were a good lord, they would give out generously at the mm. end. And in, in Beowulf, if you read and it says he was a ring giver or gave rings, they're not the rings that you're thinking of. They were these big, giant gold hoops that you could put around your neck or around your bicep. Like they were big wow. chunks of gold, often twisted. They looked really awesome and manly. So they were, it wasn't like he was giving you like a little, a little pinky ring. ring. Yeah. It was like these big hoops of gold to go around And that's your what neck. you got for fighting in the war? That was Yeah, for reward. fighting, he would he would dole out land and rings huh. uh, and try to be scant with men's lives and not give those away too easily. And so you would all gather in this hall, you'd be feasted. The green warriors would learn from the older warriors. They would do business and that's kind of what happened. And they would drink a lot. <laughs> And so if Hrothgar was a wrecker of mead benches, what that means is that he, oh, yeah. <laughs> he denied... It didn't mean that he could hold his liquor. Because that's what it sounds like. It, right. right. It meant that as a king, he denied the drinking benches to other men. Hmm. Um, right? He would wreck their bench. Why? Meaning he killed them. Yeah. Oh. If I deny you the drinking bench, I have ended oh, your I life. Oh, I see. I just thought it meant that, like, you took my bench away. <laughs> I mean, he did. And I had and, to drink and standing up. There was no fun. Yeah. 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 So he turned out to be a great king. And what that meant is that he was strong. And then other nations that he had defeated had to pay tribute to that king. So he brought in a lot of money. And then he set his eyes to hall building, building a good central hall for his community. And it, he thought it was going to be the greatest hall in all the world. And it was beautiful. And he gave it the name whose utterance was Law Heyrot. H-E-O-R-O-T. H-E-A-R-O-T? I should know this. I think it's A. H-E-A, yeah, Hayrot. Hayrot. H-E-O. H-E-O? Oh, I had it right the first time. Also, H-E-R-O-T is a mead hall, described in the Anglo-Saxon epic, Beowulf. Yeah, anyway, he makes it, and it's got gold everywhere, and it's whoa, fantastic. Whoa, whoa, back this bus up. You said that, this, that he was Danish, but this is an Anglo-Saxon book? That's what the first sentence on my Google search said. So is he, he's not an Anglo-Saxon, though. He's not from England. I'm going to have to look into this one. I apologize. I've opened yeah. a can of worms. He's um, a Dane. I mean... I mean, there's Danes in England. No, Beowulf yeah. is a Yayat, not a Dane. Wow. These guys are Danes. The Stick who, with me. Yeah. Gotcha. The guy I'm talking Hr- about is Hrothgar, not... Hrothgar's a Dane? Hrothgar's a Dane. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. A shielding, mm-hmm. right? A spear Dane. So he, he builds this hall, and it's really great, and it's great for a little while, and then some demon named Grendel comes out of the dark, mm. right? And I remember this part. Yeah, so he is a descendant of Cain. He... Cain? Yeah, Cain. Like, like, like Cain, Cain and Abel? Abel? Yeah, they cursed his cool. descendants, and so he makes all these nasty, like, murky shapes. Aren't we all descendants of Cain? Yeah, probably. Yeah. No? <laughs> anyway. I don't know. That's other Abel podcast. probably had some kids. Yeah, that's a, that's a totally different thing. Anyway, it says he's a descendant of Cain, and he is... If you've ever seen the movies... Have, have you guys ever seen the Beowulf film? I no. refuse to watch the well, Angelina so Jolie Beowulf starring... Is that in it? Yeah, she plays Grendel's mom. Wait, really? Yeah, she does. In 3D. It's is a live-action... It's not live. It's 3D. It's like the th- oh yeah, but it also stars that like the guy who plays Beowulf is I don't know. It's, it's is it really one. bad? Oh, it's really bad. <laughs> Does that make it like worth like watching at the end he kills the dragon by tearing its heart out, and the heart is hand sized. <laughs> that doesn't for a dragon for a giant dragon. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't. Yeah, it's that doesn't like and it's sense. like in his upper throat. I don't know how it got. <laughs> That's up where there. the heart goes. Yeah, yeah. naturally it beats real fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that not how it happens in the book? No, okay. not anyway, at all. Um, and it, yes, movie's bad. So, and there, there are actually a number of different Beowulf films. One of them is in space in the future. <laughs> uh, one of them involves a small bearded child. There's also the live action one, and none of them are even close to accurate. And the problem is, they also generally show Beowulf as a sympathetic character, or sorry, Grendel, Grendel as a simple sympathetic character. He had his dad killed early. He wasn't brought up well. Or in the Angelina Jolie one, he's a demon who has ear problems, and he hears. What? The, I'm not kidding. <laughs> and they're noisy, and he just gets crabby. Oh, and he gets upset. So bad. And he gets upset. So what's his rationale in Beowulf? He hates their community. Oh. He hears that they are having a good time, and there's a minstrel in there singing about the creation of the world. Yeah. And he is excluded, hmm. and he hates that they are together in the light, and he mm-hmm. is out in the dark, and so he attacks. And on his first attack, he kills 30 men. Wow. Like, just 
kills him. We find out later that he has a dragon skin bag that he stuffs some of the bodies into and then hauls off. Gross. We don't really is get. Is he any, a man? Is he? A, what is he? We, he's a demon. We don't ever get many oh. details about what he looks like. We get a few. We get that his claw has big, huge talons and spines. That he's enormous, oh. mm-hmm. really big. Like it takes four guys to carry his head, and that he's his eyes burn with delight. Mm. So he is left vague, I think, on purpose to be kind of this ethereal monster mm. shape, and not invited to the party, of course. <laughs> Obviously not. Yeah, and you have to kind of approach Beowulf not like you're going to get a straightforward tale. Mm. Like it's going to have an intro and then a middle and then a climax and then a conclusion. That's not really the the way it works. It's like three different episodes in a hero's life. Mm. And you so have Grendel, to, Grendel's mom, and then the dragon? Are those the, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And you have to kind of see it like a dreamscape. Huh. Everything's a little funny. People do things they shouldn't be able to do. There's danger kind of lurking ahead every turn. Everything is a little misty. Mm-hmm. Like, that's kind of how you have to see it. Hmm. So he comes in, he kills 30 men, and then he keeps on killing people. And it says that the guys sleeping in the meat hall move... <laughs> like further into the right. hall and they, they're not sleeping out in the main room anymore. They're like way back in the storerooms and in the closets trying to pass out. And this goes on for 12 years. Wow. Wait, he comes every night and kills people? Whenever there are people to be killed, oh, he can man. kill them. So basically the hall of ends they, up being abandoned. Do they yeah. try and fight the guy? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, but they are Danes. Right. They're, they're Viking warriors. That's like first instinct. But like yeah. all, for 12 years of them losing... To this. Repeatedly, again and again and again, getting smoked by this big monster. Hmm. And so, and then, meanwhile, over in Yatland is a guy named Beowulf. Now, Beowulf hears about the Danes' problem. And what makes this more remarkable, and this isn't explicitly highlighted in the book, so you kind of have to study to know this, but the Danes are allied with the Swedes. Okay. And the Swedes and the Yates do not get along. Oh. And so it'd be like, I don't know, who's, who's an... American enemy right now. Do we have like a straight up nemesis? Canada. Yeah. All right. So we'll yeah, say Canada, Canada. Yeah. and we'll say Canada is allied with France. Stinking, <laughs> stinking French. Yeah. So we we hate Canada, but I hear someone's having problems in uh, France. France, and so I go help France. Right. So he was doing something magnanimous, helping an ally of his enemy. Okay. So he goes and he hears and he takes fourteen of his buddies, making fifteen in all. And they go, and he says, he lands on the shore, he talks to the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard takes him to... But it takes him like 12 years to show up on the scene? Well, they, I mean, you would assume as a Viking that they're eventually going to take care of it. But then the rumors spread. I mean, they don't have internet, they don't have phones, (laughs) it takes a while for rumors to spread. (laughs) Sure. So rumors spread, and he shows up on the scene, and goes and talks, and you'd be thinking that the tale is all like, he bursts through the door and he's already drunk. And that's not the case. It is more honorable than you'd think. He comes, he's confronted by a coast guard. The coast guard says, it's my job to wash the land. Who are you people? You better tell me. And he says, here's my purpose. These are my men. Here's why we've come. Can I please go talk to Hrothgar? They leave their weapons. They approach a messenger first, and then they go and approach the king. And there's all these necessary kind of honor things. And we find out that Hrothgar and Beowulf actually kind of know each other. (laughs) Beowulf's dad is named Edgetheo. Which is a cool name. That's a cool name. Yeah, so Edge Theo turned out he had he killed a guy that was he about was, to kill Rothgar? N- no, so oh. Rothgar isn't even in the scene oh. yet. So Edge Theo was fighting with this guy and he killed, I think it was a wolfing. And so he kills a wolfing, and because the Yayats are afraid of war, like a, a backfire, they kick Edge Theo out. They oh. say, You have to go because we don't want war with the wolfing people. Mm. So he goes to Hrothgar and says, hey, could you help me out? And Hrothgar pays what's called a blood price. I don't know if we've talked about the blood price before. I think nope, nope. maybe a little. But the way it works is if I say kill, I don't know, neither of you have kids. Nope. You have a dog, though. I have a dog. All right, so if I kill your dog. Yeah, I'd be really sad. Because I stink and hate that dog. Yeah, And because my dog's the best. <laughs> so I, I hate your dog and I kill your dog. Yep. You are kind of almost by law required to I avenge yourself. You, right? Yeah. yeah. And so if I and then if I die, well then someone from my family has to kill you, and mm-hmm. then you've got to kill. Someone. It's just it you know spirals into these feuds that mm-hmm. last forever. And so what I can do is say, hey, look, I'm sorry, I killed, <laughs> killed your, your dog, dog. Yeah. and we can go to the Lord, and the Lord will set an appropriate blood price mm-hmm. and say you have to pay, I don't know, what would be appropriate, an infinite amount of money for a perfect dog. I don't even. I don't know, like three grand. Okay. Right, so I pay you three grand. I say, I'm sorry about your dog. I stink and hated that Sarah, dog. Sarah, who's listening to this podcast, is going to think three grand is way too little. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, I take your point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then the feud is, you ended. know, hopefully yeah. ended. Yeah. But I'll still be mad. Usually didn't work in practice. Right. 
Usually the, the I would take the three grand and then refused yeah. or you'd take the money and still kill right, me exactly. or I'd refuse to pay it or I was too poor to pay it or, you know, any number of things would end in a feud. Hey man, that's like two gold neck rings. Oh, wow. Gold neck rings. Okay, that's yeah. like that then. Never mind. But so Edge Theo shows up on Hrothgar's door and Hrothgar pays the blood price for this wolfing that was killed, yep. letting Edge Theo go home. Mm. So they have kind of a rapport already. Mm. So they stay and they hang out. And Hrothgar is a good king. Yeah, yeah he's a great king. And so they, they feast the night before, right? So Beowulf has said, I will face this horrible monster of yours. Uh, let's see if I can find some quotes here. Does Beowulf come in with any, like, prior reputation? No, actually, the, the Yeats didn't think much of him at oh, all. Yeah. <laughs> they thought that he wasn't worth much. We find out that out way later in the book. <laughs> that They're like, yeah, they didn't really think he was worth much of, his, much of anything. That's awesome. Um, Hail to thee, Hrothgar. This is what he says when he meets the king. I am Helak's kinsman and vassal. On many a renowned deed I ventured in my youth. And remember, this is a translation that's a little more difficult. There's another one called uh, that's by Seamus Haney. It looks like Seamus Heaney. And it's far easier to understand and approach. So if you're looking to get into this, you don't have to jump straight to the Tolkien translation. You can jump in the easier one. And I'm just reading over your shoulder, but is, is it also in prose or is it in is it's, it poetry? I can't really. It's in prose. Is it prose? Okay. Yeah. Because the Seamus Haney one is uh, poetry, isn't it? Isn't it in verse? It's still in prose. Okay. To me, on my native soil, the matter of Grendel became known and revealed. Travelers upon the sea reported that this hall, fairest of houses, stands empty, and to all men useless, as soon as the light of evening is hid beneath heaven's pale. Thereupon the worthiest of my people and wise men counseled me to come to thee, King, Hoth King, King, King Hrothgar, for they had learned the power of my body's strength. They had themselves observed it when I returned from the toils of my foes, earning their enmity, where five I bound, making desolate the race of monsters. And when I slew amid the waves by night, the water demons, enduring bitter need, avenging the afflictions of the wind-loving Yeats, destroying those, destroying those hostile things, woe they had asked for. And now I shall with Grendel, with that fierce slayer, hold debate alone with the ogre. Now therefore will I ask of thee, Prince of the Glorious Danes, Defender of the Shieldings, this one boon, that thou deny not me, O Protector of Warriors, fair Lord of Peoples, since I have come from so far away, that only I may, and may my proud company of men, this dauntless company, make Hayrot clean. I have learned, too, that this fierce slayer in his savagery to weapons gives no heed. I, too, then will disdain, so love me, Helak, my liege lord, to bear either sword or wide shield, yellow bossed, to battle. Nay, with my gripe I shall seize upon the foe and engage in mortal contest with hate against hate. There, to the judgment of the Lord, shall he resign himself whom death doth take. So he's going to wrestle. No way. He's going to wrestle. Yeah, so wow. he says, I, not only am I going to fight this thing that has been slaying all of you for 12 years, so I'm going to do it without a sword or shield. Now, they had chainmail, which was a big advancement in weaponry back then, mm. right? It meant it was relatively light. It didn't have gaps. It could stop, you know, stab, you know, slashing mm. weapons. It was way better than the leather and metal stuff they'd had prior to that. But that's still not much against a demon that right. can kill 30 guys in one go. Yeah. So he, so then they feast, right? And they feast. And then there's a fella named Unferth that stands up and says, hey, weren't you the guy who went on a swimming contest with a dude named Brekka. And if I remember right, you lost. Oh. Isn't that true? Wow. And Beowulf says, well, you have your facts a little bit wrong. I did have a swimming contest with Brekka. Me and him swam for five nights in the winter, <laughs> in the waves, Great. with chain mail and swords. And then we got separated by the wind. And then I got attacked by sea monsters, <laughs> killed nine of them, and then ended up on the coast of Finland, which... It, I've looked it up, and it can be either as little as 200 miles away or 5,000, <laughs> depending on where you are. Where you are. Yeah. So he ended up swimming for forever, and he's like, so, you know, I came out the, the stronger swimmer. Now, I can't remember any contest you've yeah. been in, Unferth, <laughs> that good. bears repeating. And then he, go he goes way further. Remember, they're all a little bit, a little bit drunk by now. And right. he's like, also, you killed your own family, so you're going straight to hell. <laughs> and then he, like, really wow. ramps it up. Oh, dang. Did yeah. he actually do that? 
Poor this, this, this guy killed his family? It doesn't really say. Oh, he just, wow. He just says, yeah, you're a bad swimmer, and you killed your family, and I'm pretty sure you're going to help. And then he stands up and gives a formal boast and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm sorry, did you say a formal boast? Yeah. So it was, it's, it's a thing where you kind of stand up and you say, here's what I intend to do. I intend to do this great deed. And if you can fulfill it, then your worth is proved. If you can't, then you are kind of disgraced. It wasn't bragging in the same way that we see bragging now. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's like, I'm going to win game seven. It's like one of those. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm the greatest. Go, then you got to go do it. Yeah. It's like every boxer ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> has ever has there ever been a boxer or MMA fighter so that's like, know. you know what? He's been training really hard. <laughs> I might lose this one. Yeah. yeah. I've been training hard too, but you know, who, who knows? <laughs> like never has that happened. Never. All right. So he, the night comes. So and, like Mr. T and Rocky three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they're all sleeping. All of Beowulf's men think they're certainly going to die. <laughs> <laughs> they are absolutely 100%. sure this is it. So they lay down. Everyone's really nervous. I don't think anyone was really getting any sleep. And then Grendel, of course, shows up, busts the door open. And then as soon as he sees someone, he just starts eating him. Like he mm-hmm. eats the, a whole dude before anything else happens. Gross. Hand, foot, the whole, the whole stuff. And mm-hmm. it's kind of graphic. And then Beowulf waits and he, he pretends, pretends to be sleeping. And then when Grendel reaches for him, Beowulf gets him in an arm lock. And then they wrestle their brains out wow. for a while. And they knock over a bunch of chairs. And all of Beowulf's men stand up and try to hit him with their swords and just kind of <laughs> don't succeed at it. Yeah. Turns out later that the reason they couldn't, and it was a good thing that Beowulf didn't try to use a sword, is because Grendel had a spell that took away the harm of every hmm. sword. He could never be hurt by weapons. So he was actually kind of kind of huh. lucky that he swore them off. And then he wrestles. And then Grendel wants to run away, and eventually you, you see a wound appear on Grendel's mm. shoulder because he's got him in an arm lock, and then he goes further, and you see the sin- sinews explode, and then the bones do. Oh, yeah. And then There's it kind of right? says, Grendel runs off. And then it goes a, a little further, and then it gives you the punchline of saying, well, it's because Beowulf was holding his entire arm. Yeah. That's crazy. He and tore his tore arm, arm clean off. And it was enough to kill Grendel, right? Grendel runs oh, Grendel home. Does die. And then from the bleeding, like, that's a that's a wound you don't so recover from. So did they, from. like, follow the blood and find his little Grendel lair? And... <laughs> no, without medical attention, so you're Grendel, in pretty big trouble so with Grendel's a tough arm. Grendel's yeah, Grendel dead. dies. Now, for, for sure we know Grendel's dead. For sure. Okay. Grendel is toast. Are you waiting for Beowulf too? Is I'm that? just I'm like, Grendel's revenge. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> You'll see later. We are, we're sure Grendel's dead. So they are happy, right? Everything's awesome. And they get on their horses the next morning. Oh, man, and they're, they're like, hanging that arm over oh, the yeah, bar. I bet. Yeah. Did you, have you read this before? No. They literally hang it over the Do door. They, oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. They display yeah. it I mean, over the door. It's just You'd like, be proud of that, right? Well, it's my instinct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've got some Viking I got some northern, <laughs> northern, northern blood. <laughs> for sure. So they, they get up the next morning, and the world is rosy and wonderful and bright, and they get on their chestnut steeds, and they race around, and there's a minstrel that's making up Beowulf's song as they ride, and they're all like, you're so great, Beowulf, and he just rides, and the minstrel's like, oh, great Beowulf, he killed the Grendel Fair, and like, they, so they go off, and... Is this how the Second Amendment was born? The right to bear arms. Uh... <sighs> Sorry, I keep going. Okay. And Hrothgar... <laughs> it just hurts. Hrothgar makes good on his offers of spoils, should Grendel be killed, mm-hmm. and gives him just loads of treasure, all yeah. kinds of good stuff, and they make fair the death of Beowulf's man in gold, mm. right? Oh, the they, guy that got eaten was Beowulf's dude? Yeah, oh, unfortunately. That's too bad. Yeah, it was kind of sad. So he's gone, but they get gold for it, <laughs> and he gives him a bunch yeah. of horses and some other things, and, and it's, it's great, and they have a good time, and then they all go to sleep. And that's not the end of the story. Nope. Uh, we also, I'm, I'm trying to decide, well, there's, there's kind of an in-between. Like, there's an interlude where a minstrel sings a song. And it's about some politics stuff that happens. And I don't know, I don't want to go to, too far into it, but the basics is that there's a war between two clans, and they eventually decide on a truce, mm. but it's too, it's too far into winter to let one side sail home. Oh. So they have to stay in the hall. Oh, that's awkward. That's- and it's not good. And eventually, not. you know, they're looking at the swords that would killed some of their friends, and they go back on the truce and kill each other and sail home. And right. it kind of sets sort of a feeling of doom, you know, for the it, rest of the yeah, um, like yeah. right. It's right after something great happened. Yeah, why is this minstrel singing that song? Come on, man, like <laughs> sing something the, a little happier. Sing the happy songs. Yeah. yeah. So it's it turns out to be like kind of this terrible song, and. 
So then they all go to sleep after the song. And <laughs> Grendel's mother too. comes and seeks revenge. Hmm. So she gets in there and she grabs the arm off the wall. Mm-hmm. So she gets her son, son's arm back. And she grabs a dude named Eshera and takes him. takes him. Oh. So they're like, oh, no. And he was one of Hrothgar's favorite counselors. Oh. And so he's like, oh, no, my best friend. So they have to go and they ride after her. And they have a chat. And Beowulf. With, with, with the, Grendel's mom? Yeah. No, no, no. So, sorry. He's got it going on? I, Hrothgar and Beowulf <laughs> chat before going in. And we, we get one of the most famous quotes in the book. And it's Beowulf to Hrothgar. And he says, wise sir, do not grieve. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. For every one of us living, <laughs> get him back than be, rather than be sad. For every one of us living in this world means waiting for our end. Let whoever can win glory before death. When a warrior is gone, that will be his best and only bulwark. And the reason this is so famous is because that's kind of just the Viking attitude. Right. right? If someone gets you, you got to get them back. And the thing you got to win before you die is glory. And that quote stands in contrast to everything it says about God through the whole thing, mm-hmm. right? God's in control and all this stuff. So it's this weird melding of a Christian belief in God and also depending on the glory of the warrior pagan world. Hmm. So he decides to jump in and go after this whole thing. And he's not going in without sword the sword this time. So he brings one. Okay. Well, Unferth actually lends him one called oh. Hrunting. And he says, here you go. It's a hard edge. It's never failed me. It's going to be awesome because the steel sometimes wasn't that great in Viking swords and they would snap. Mm. In fact, you usually took two swords when you went to battle. (laughs) And presumably Grendel's mom doesn't have the same spell spell that Grendel did. So presumably. So he they go to her mirror and at her mirror, the water burns mirror. Yeah, it's like a it's like a little pond. Oh. Mm. So she's got this pond, and the water kind of burns. Mm. It's super unnatural. And then he, they see all these weird slithering, like, dragon shapes and salamanders, and it's not clear what they are. It's like li- lizards and water beings. Yeah. Beowulf kills one with an arrow, oh. and they drag it out, and they're like, whoa, <laughs> that thing's weird. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then, and then Beowulf's right. like, here I go. And then he, he jumps in? in. Yeah. To the burning water. And full of lizards. Okay, great. And he jumps and he, he swims and he swims for the better part of a day. So he <laughs> holds his breath. And this isn't the only time he's done something crazy in the yeah. water, right? Swimming in the winter in Scandinavia is the first <laughs> sign that, you know, they're doing unreal things. Right. So he swims until he hits the bottom and then he sees the mom and she is not happy he's there. Right, of course. And they fight and they fight and hunting is just not getting the job done. Mm. It's not biting. And eventually mm. she grabs him and takes him to her little cave so that he's he can stand on some solid ground and the water isn't, you know, working against him. So they fight some more and the sword just won't bite. And so he looks around and then he sees another sword, an ancient blade forged by giants. And so he's cool. like, yes. So he grabs that thing and then hacks her good and, you know, hacks her head off. And then he looks around holding the sword high and finds Grendel's body. Oh, and then cuts the head off of that. <laughs> sure. And so the the Grendel's mom's blood actually melts the blade <sighs> of the sword. It, it's like weird, crazy acid blood. Yeah. So he swims back with two prizes. So, does, so Grendel's mom looks like Grendel also? Or do they ever talk about? It's never clear. Okay. It just calls her a turn hag. She's a lady. Okay. And it's weird. It's kind of sad because she was seeking just, revenge yeah. for her only son. Right. She was doing what he says we should be doing. The, the, it, the blood debt thing you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. yeah. And we can get to that later, right? But... She is a little bit more sympathetic than Grendel, at least. Mm. She is following almost the law of the land, getting right. revenge. So he grabs the hilt of the sword that's full of jewels, and he grabs the head of Grendel, and he heads back up. And by this time, he's been down there like nine hours, mm. right? It says it's the ninth hour of the day. It's late. Right. And Hrothgar and all of those guys have already left because oh, all of the elders were like, he's dead. Yeah. He's dead. Because <laughs> when he killed the mom, some of that blood made its way into the water and mm. they saw it kind of upturn and there was blood in it. And so they're like, well, he's dead for sure. <laughs> so let's go home. So they all go home and all of Beowulf's warriors stay kind of hanging yeah, out on the, on the thing, hoping to see their lord. And then he, I always imagine this being a little bit like, you ever see Terminator 2? Yeah, mm-hmm. of course. Where his like thumb comes out of yeah. the water like that. Yeah. I always imagine he's like raising out of the water and they see <laughs> Grendel's head first and they're like, oh, <laughs> what is that? And then they see his arm and they're like, oh, it's just <laughs> such a cinematic moment that has yeah. never been taken advantage of in any of the films. Even the one in space. Even the one in space. <laughs> Probably especially the one in space. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's got this giant head. It takes four warriors to carry the thing. It's huge. And he's got this sword. And they go back and... More partying. More partying, more gifts. But Hrothgar doesn't just 
stop there. What he gives to Beowulf is actually a long talk about how to be a good king, hmm. which is weird. Beowulf is not a king. Right. So let me read you a piece of this, if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Okay. This one's a little bit lengthier. Wondrous it is to tell how the, Alm- the mighty God doth apportion in his purpose deep unto the race of men wisdom, lands, and noble estate. Of all things he is Lord. At whiles the heart's thought of man of famous house, he suffereth in delight to walk, granteth him in his realm earthly joy, ruling over men within his walled town, maketh the religions of the earth, earth as his to sway, a kingdom vast, so that the end thereof in his unwisdom he cannot himself conceive. He dwells in plenty. No wit do age or sickness thwart him, nor doth a black care grieve his soul, nor strife in any place bring murderous hatred forth. Nay, all the world goeth to his desire. He knows nothing of worse fate until within him a measure of arrogance doth grow and spread. Now sleeps the watchman, guardian of the soul. Too sound that sleep in troubles wrapped, The slayer is very nigh, who in malice shooteth arrows from his bow. Then beneath his guard he is smitten to the heart with bitter shaft, the strange and crooked biddings of the accursed spirit he cannot himself defend. Too little now him seems what long he hath enjoyed, his grim heart fills with greed. In no wise doth he deal gold-plated rings to earn him praise. And the doom that cometh he forgets and heeds not, because God, the Lord of glory, hath before granted him a portion of honor high." Thereafter, in the final end, it cometh to pass that his fleshly garb, being mortal, faileth, falls in death ordained. Another succeeds to all, who unrecking scattereth his precious things, the old hoarded treasures of that man, his wrath he fears not. Defend thee from that deadly malice, dear Beowulf, best of knights, and choose for thyself the better part, counsels of everlasting worth, countenance no pride, O champion in thy renown. Now for a little while, Thy valor is in flower, but soon shall it be that sickness or the sword rob thee of thy might, or fire's embrace, or water's wave, or bite of blade, or flight of spear, or dreadful age, or the flashing of thine eyes shall fail and fade. Very soon it will come that thee, proud knight, shall death lay low. Mm. Even so did I for half a hundred years beneath heaven rule the ring proud Danes, and with my battle fenced them round from many, many a neighbor over this earth below with swords and spears so that I counted no man beneath the compass of the sky, my likely foe. Lo, a change of this fortune in my very home befell me, grief after gladness, when Grendel, ancient enemy, became the invader of my house, and I for that trespass unceasingly endured a deep sorrow in my heart. For this be to the Creator thanks to the everlasting Lord, that I have lived in my life that long strife over, to gaze on this head dyed with cruel gore. He's looking at Grendel's brains. Right. Go now to thy seat, Use the gladness of the feast, war's honor with thee. Between us shall many a host of treasures pass when morn shall come. So he says, look, it's going great right now. You're feeling really good. You're at the height of your powers. Everything's awesome. It doesn't stay that way, right? You might, you might rule it all, but if you let that pride overtake you, it'll make you a bad king. Yep. And then even if you amass all, amass all this treasure, the kid after you is going to scatter it all over the place. So why would you work that hard? It's It's a... An incredible example of a good king being wise in his praise. He could have praised Beowulf and in that moment made a terror, like made a tyrant, Mm -hmm. but he didn't. He said, you're feeling good, things could go bad. Be smart and now enjoy the feast. Hmm. Does Beowulf take the advice or is he like a bro and he's like, whatever, whatever is stupid, I'm I'm the best. Well, that's the thing. Beowulf isn't a king. He's just a warrior. And so he ends up going home and things are great for Hrothgar, right? Hmm. Grendel dead, lady dead. Everything's great. He goes home and gives some rewards to his lord, Helak, his queen, Higgid, gives her some horses and stuff, and everything's good. And then after Helak dies in a battle, Beowulf eventually, you know, avenges himself. Mm. Then the <laughs> nobody has faith in Helak's kid, right? Oh, so they're like, yeah. hey, Beowulf, you should be in charge. <laughs> right. And he's like, ah, I don't really want to. It's not my place, right? I, right? I'm not the prince. And they're like, yeah, but he's kind of a wuss. And he's like, look, 
I'll, tr- I'll stay with him and support him and train him. It's like, okay. So the, the kingdom passes to Heardred, mm. and then Heardred gets The West killed. Kid? Yeah, the mm-hmm. West Kid. But he doesn't live that long, oh. just like they thought. And then Beowulf eventually takes over, and he does avenge Heardred. Like, he gets him back. He kills oh, cool. a guy named Dayraven the Frank. This is <laughs> such a cool name. Dayraven? The f- the Dayraven Frank. the Frank. A French guy. Yeah. I thought it was just like a very honest person. That was the Frank? Yeah, he oh, was a very... <laughs> I killed your king. <laughs> Those pants I make it. you look yeah. stupid. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Thanks, you're not wrong. <laughs> to my name, man. I gotta do it. And so he takes the kingdom, and he rules it for 50 years. And so this right here marks a big break in the novel, right? It doesn't right. really... It's usually not highlighted. It just goes in the next, next paragraph. But now we have seen the warrior on the rise, and we are moving towards the warrior in old age. So 50 years pass oh, wow. that he rules the Yates, and he rules them well. He took the advice. He's a great king. Yep. And then turns out that there's a dragon. <laughs> and out of nowhere, there's always a dragon. Thing. And what did what did dragons usually do? They What's hold, their like thing? They hoard gold. Treasure. Yeah, yeah, they want treasure and they sit on it. They yeah. sit on gold. And so we find out that there's a treasure hoard of gold from an old race that died out. Oh. It's really sad. Like the guy that put all the gold in there, mm-hmm. he goes, "Well, I'm the only one of my country left." I guess I'll just wander the world until I die. Wow. <laughs> and, then, and then he leaves, and that's and what he does. And the dragon just shows up. And then the dragon takes over, and yeah. he's been sitting on it for 300 years. Oh, wow. And there's a slave, and he has been kicked out by his master, and he doesn't know what to do. And so he stumbles upon this hoard of gold, steals a cup, and then returns it to his master to mm-hmm. be Do we know why dragons, like, hoard gold? Is it just, like, their nature? Yeah, I don't know. Why do, why do cats jump in boxes? <laughs> yep, it's true. If it fits, I sits. <laughs> Maybe it's a comfort thing. Maybe they're Maybe so big that they can't mm-hmm. find good rocks. Like so you can actually sort of spread out on the yeah. gold, and it kind of jitters away, mm-hmm. scratches know. their scales a little bit. Uh-huh. We we crack the code, but it just seems like I don't know. They're not going to use it, right? They're literally just going to sit on it. They're right? just going to sit on it. I'm trying to think of like a modern analogy. It's like companies that have money offshore. Mm-hmm. Why do they have it offshore? <laughs> well, they're avoiding to, taxes. To avoid taxes, yeah. I don't know. It's just like you sit on a big. It's just yeah. Anyway, whatever. Maybe stupid dragon. Well, maybe they know something we yep. don't. Like they know the end of the world is coming, and the thing uh, we need yes. the most is gold. Is gold? Yeah, because it'll like be in the transistors of our warheads or something. I don't know. What? Yep. There you go. They're just smarter than we are, and we have no idea. Anyway, there's a there's a dragon in here. Yeah, dragon's got gold. a lot of gold. Yep. And he is angry that he's missing a cup, and so he goes and he burns what? burns a bunch of houses. You serious? Yeah, I'm dead serious. He's he gets gold super mad. One cup. He's oh. like, I can't believe this. And then he goes and burn, burns a bunch of houses, and one of them is Beowulf's house. Oh, oh that's bad. And Beowulf burned the wrong house, buddy. Seriously. In the Seamus Haney translation, it says he was confused with anger. Like he, <laughs> everything always goes Beowulf's way, and yeah. so this is the first time he's like, "What is happening? My house <laughs> burned down? Yeah. How does this even happen?" And so he has to fight this dragon. So they recruit the the guy, the burglar, mm-hmm. and then he gets twelve other dudes to go with him to go find out what's going on with this dragon. Mm-hmm. Are right? they dwarves? And that's the funny thing. Does that sound like a book to you? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. There's a thief, a king, and dragon. 12 other guys, yep. and a dragon. Yep. I mean, this this is The Hobbit. And they actually brought that up to Tolkien himself. Oh, really? They said, like, this sounds a, a lot similar. like Beowulf. And he's and he actually wrote one of the seminal criticisms of Beowulf mm-hmm. called The Monsters and the Critics. And in it, he says, well, I mean, he, is, he has said, yes, I had it in, like, I have studied that book so right. thoroughly. I, he translated it. Right? He's, he was steeped in it. He's like, there's no way it wasn't in my yeah, head. Yeah, he's allowed to. Right. At that point, you're allowed to. But he didn't specifically think sure. about it and steal it. It was right. just one of those things that was so deeply ingrained in the person of Tolkien that, you know, thinking of dragons, thinking of kings, like they all, so everything kind of came out that so way. Did, so he, Tolkien did this translation before he wrote The Hobbit? I don't know when he did which. Okay. Uh, but either way, he, he was very familiar with the book. Right, right, right. Okay, so he takes these dudes, they find out where the barrow is, and Beowulf knows that he's going to be facing a dragon, and so he has this special shield ma- made of iron, because their shields were typically wood. Oh, right? It's light, bad. it's sturdy, yeah. it's lighter than metal. But not so good when you're going up against a dragon. Yeah, yeah not and so do good Beowulf dragon. dragons have like fire-breathing faces like the dragons we know? They do, but they're probably smaller. Mm. You're thinking probably oh. like Pete's dragon, like big oh, fat bellies yep. and mm-hmm. lots of spines. And, you know, the movies make them look scarier. Yeah, yeah. This one was probably about 50 feet long, but think more like Sky Serpent with big wings oh, gotcha. okay. than dragon you're thinking of. Because it, it lands at a portion and at one point it chomps on his shoulder, mm-hmm. but it doesn't 
like tear his whole sure, sure. shoulder off, yeah. right? So it's big, but it's more snaky than huh. anything else. Okay. So like those dragons you see, like the size of dragons you see in the old Renaissance paintings of uh, St. George when he's killing the dragon, it's not like this giant Tolkien dragon. Yeah, probably. I have, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm Googling this as you say those things, though, so sorry. Yeah. St. George and the dragon. I know. And I know the story, but I just don't know the Renaissance paintings. Okay. Anyway, he goes and he sits down and he says, if I knew a way to fight this dragon without weapons, <laughs> I would do it. That help? Yeah. It's even smaller, though. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's too small. Yeah. And so he, he says, if I, if I could do this without weapons, I would do it, but I don't know how to face fire without weapons. So I have to take a shield and I have to take a sword. And keep in mind, it's been 50 years. How old do you suppose oh, yeah. he is at this point? He's, you know, he's, he's an older then? dude. 70s, 80s. I mean, 70s, 80s, maybe? Yeah. Like if he was early 30s or late 20s? That's what he was when, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really say, but you have to put him as old. So he sits down, and it is not a, a joyful moment. He's not like, let's go to the fray. He kind of talks about this sad thing and doom and ho- horrible history and Wait, all these things that Wait, why do you have to, happened. why don't just say, I'm build my house 50 miles downstream. I'm, I'm just, let, you know, the dragon, he, you know, he, he, it's out of his system. He burned down my house. I'm just not going to worry about it. I'm just going to, like, keep Beowulfing. Graham, you're a mountain climber. It's his Everest. <laughs> okay. Is it really? I mean, it's not. Or I was, I was wondering if it was like he needed to avenge, like this dragon did something against him, so he ne- he now needs to go and take the life. I mean, of it's dragon. a threat to the people. It's a dragon, yeah. and it's a monster. He kills monsters. But he's old. Don't you retire at some point? <laughs> so we can <laughs> open an inn. The wisdom is <laughs> questionable, right? Should he have let other Help people the handle this monster as hunters? a king? Hmm. Maybe. But at this point, he's old anyway. Right. So if you're going to go... Might as well be facing a dragon. Might as well be facing a dragon. And he took a pick troop. And so he takes all these guys. He goes down there and he goes, Brah! and yells. And then the dragon comes out. Oh. And the dragon lands. So he actually mm-hmm. has a moment. But all, all the people that he picked take off. Of course they do. Like yeah. They all bail to the woods. And so Beowulf is left standing there and facing this dragon alone. Mm. And he can't get his sword to bite. <sighs> He's, he's using his ancestral oh, blade problem. named yep. Nagling. Okay. And Nagling, when he brought it down on the dragon's head, it snapped. Oh, it wow. It breaks. That's bad. And it says the reason it breaks is because Beowulf is so strong, he breaks swords. <laughs> like, he can never get them to work just because cool. he's too big. So the sword's never ha- sword never does what it's supposed to. And so he's fighting there. He's in danger. And then we have kind of a meanwhile in the trees mm-hmm. and one warrior named Wiglaf, mm-hmm. or it's actually pronounced Wiglaf. But Wiglaf sounds better, yes. and it's also a great name for a dog, by yeah. the way. Oh. Um, you and you'll see why in a second. Okay. So Wiglaf is a green warrior. He has never been in battle. He has, you know, this is his first anything ever. And he turns and he says, you guys are a disgrace. When he gave you weapons, when he gave you swords and shields and gold and land, he was throwing it away. Because in the time wow. when he needs you, you are not there. What a shame it would be to go back home wearing the weapons that he gave me rather than use them. Wow. That's terrible. You should be ashamed. Good job, Wiglaf. Yeah, I seriously. know. And then he turns and he runs and he joins Beowulf. Oh, wow. Stands next to him and says, go on, Beowulf. You got this, buddy. It's, it's I'm awesome. I'm with you, man. And that's why it's a great dog name is because it's like man's best friend. Like He's there in the thick of it. Who's a good boy? Who's a good Wiglof. boy? Wiglof. And there's this moment where they are using the same shield, right, to shield them both from the flames. And I, I, like, I like to choose microcosms, if I can, of the book and the main themes of the book. And it's right here. It's men in community mm. shielded against all of the forces of the outside world that want to do them harm. It's a a great moment and also again really cinematic I don't right. know why they ever, don't ever use this stuff is and the dragon so, in the really bad Beowulf movie you were talking about yeah is it just Beowulf you versus the dragon well it depends there's one where the dragon I think is just like more dudes oh it's, there's no real dragon okay. and the one the 3D one there is a big dragon and he just fights it on his own it I'll give you a rundown on that movie in a second okay fair. so okay. he he's fighting with Wiglaf it, back, back to the story He's fighting with Wiglaf, and Wiglaf stabs the dragon in the, in the stomach, and so the fire gets to be less, so they actually have a shot. And then Beowulf turns and takes out a knife and stabs it in the flank. But it, earlier, when he was fighting alone, the dragon had clamped him on the shoulder, mm. and the dragon was poisonous. Oh. Mm. 
So the dragon dies from the wound in the hip, and Beowulf is like laying there dying from this poison. poison. Yeah. And he sits down, he doesn't freak out, he sits down and he stares at the rocks around the cave. You like, can't like suck it out? Nah, it's, oh, man. it's bad news. And he pretty much says, Wiglaf, good job. <laughs> Can you go get the gold? I really want to see it. <laughs> I want to know that I'm leaving my people well off when I die. So Wiglaf goes, yeah. And then he runs off into the thing and he can kind of see they explain it because there's this big gold banner and the light reflects off it. So mm. he gets a bunch of the gold and he brings it out and he's like, look, it's great. And then Beowulf's cool. like, awesome. Thank you. I, you know, you're great. I wish I could have given my weapons to my own son, mm. but I give them to you. Wow. Right? He like kind of passes the mantle to Wiglaf. Um, and then a messenger carries the, you know, Beowulf is dead. He carries it up to all the people on the, you know, waiting for the outcome. And he pretty much has this really long speech. It's one of the longest in the books. It's basically like, we're all going to die because the Swedes who we hate us are going to hear that Beowulf is dead. And they're also going to hear that our warriors right. ran from the battle from the dragon. Right. Mm-hmm. And so judging by the quality of men that we have, like we are we are doomed. Yeah. And then they mourn Beowulf, they put him in a barrow, and they bury a bunch of gold with him. And that's... That's the end of it. That's the end so of it. There, so the, the end of the story is Beowulf's dead, and everyone's scared that the Swedes are going to take him over. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Okay. Is, there, is there, like, another part to this? <laughs> no, but that's what's interesting. So there's... The, the book is written in something called alliterative verse, and this right. is something Tolkien points out. So alliterative verse means it, it, the, the syllables don't matter. But every line has four stressed syllables. Doesn't matter how many there are, like total syllables, but there are four of them stressed. So like, I went down to, I went down to the store to find a cake. I went down to the store to find a cake. Da, 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 da. Or um, winter went wild in the waves. Winter went wild, went wild in the waves. So there should be four, four stresses, one way or the other. Okay. And, Stresses number one and three should alliterate. So if it's a W noise, it's got to be another W noise. Okay. Two sometimes does, and four never does. And this reflects the story in that the first and third battles Beowulf has are with big monsters that threaten his community. Grendel, the dragon, that attacked from nowhere. Mm-hmm. The second is sort of similar, right? And it's linked with the first one. There, by the way, also is a, usually a gap between the first two stresses and the second two. But there is no fourth battle, is there? The Swedes would be implied. Oh, okay. So one, Grendel, second stress is the mom, and then there's that big gap of 50 years, just mm-hmm. like there would be in the line, and then battle three, and then the implied fourth battle that never alliterates uh, with the other stressed syllables. So Bummer. the structure of the tale reflects the meter in which it was written. I tend to think that that's more of an accident than intentional, but it's there. Sure. So a quick rundown of the movie. Yeah, sure, the important stuff. Yeah, Beowulf goes to kill Grendel's mom, and she's Angelina Jolie, right. made of gold. It's weird. That's weird. And not okay. appropriate. And they spend some time in the cave. And she's not dead at the end of that time. Yeah. And then he leaves. Uh-huh. And the dragon is his son. That doesn't... What? From, from Grendel's mom? Yeah. Oh, okay, got so it. So Beowulf and Grendel's mom get together, and right. they produce the dragon, strangely. So it, so it is an actual dragon. Sorry. It's an actual dragon, okay, got it. but Perfect. later, I think, when he's, like, dying in the water, the dragon stands up and is, like, a person. It's, it's weird. It's weird, yeah. It's super weird, and it's not good. And they mess up the tail, and the dragon heart's small. It's, it's just not. <laughs> it's not the greatest thing uh, ever. All right, so lessons to take from this. Mm. I think at the end of novels, we, we always really want there to be some big moral story. Right. And we have to remember in what sense, in what place this was said, right? This would have been entertainment at, at a party. It would have been mm-hmm. an example of kingship to follow. It would have been something to inspire us to, to goodness, to honor, to battle, to all of these things. Looking at this good man who worked his whole life, but there's also questions of, you know, what does glory leave us with? He was one of the most glorious men ever. He literally died fighting a dragon that he still killed, mm-hmm. and his people are doomed at the end of it. So you can question the wisdom of that choice, but he was going to die sometime anyway, right. and no one was really taken over, right? If Wiglaf is your best option, you're kind of in trouble. <laughs> and, and also, the, you know, what, what is gold worth if no one is there to 
have it. And it's kind of just sort of a narrative of basic good versus evil. Mm-hmm. Like that, that is an, it, you know, it's an old school tale that we as a community would sit and listen to this and say, wow, aren't the people I'm sitting with great? Isn't it good to have a good king who does good things and isn't selfish? But I can imagine that if, like, when I was a kid, my mom, I can imagine my mom would read this book and say, this all would have been avoided if they had just invited Grendel to the party. Oh. Right, like, why not just in, include the the kid that's sort of, you know, a little weird? Yeah, sure, he's a little weird and he's got, like, a bunch of claws and stuff, but he all he really wants is just to be part of the community. So the evil, the, the book makes it clear that he is evil by nature, right? It is not that he hmm. wanted good, it's that he hated good. Hmm. So he, whenever he sees a good thing, these men coming together in mirth and being better together, he just wants to tear, destroy it. Yeah, he wants to tear it apart. So you got to get rid of that thing. He hates that they're having a good time. And it's not that, like, he could have asked. Right. There, there's always the option that he could have been like, hey, I know I'm a demon, but I'm a really nice fella. So can I hang, out, hang out But he is. But his nature wouldn't allow that. Wouldn't allow that, right? He is outcast by nature and he hated it and wanted to destroy it. He is not, he, in the book, he is not a sympathetic character gotcha. at all. You are not made to like him. Okay. I am, I feel a little bit for his mom. Right. But. Yeah, because she's doing the very thing that Beowulf says you should be doing in life. So does, is there no character that looks at Grendel and is like, well, she did the right thing, but I just am stronger and I have the magic sword. But she bring herself by stealing that dude on the way out mm. when she busts into Harold? But she wouldn't, no, that's the blood price, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, you're right, actually. Never mind. Because Beowulf kills the kid, and then Beowulf's mom takes the dude. No, she doesn't stay in wreck shop. She just takes one guy. Yeah. But then, yeah, but no, but then that, that's what causes Beowulf's reaction, because she um, w- went for vengeance. Yeah. So I think she brought it on herself. What should he have done? What should, what should have happened, AJ? Sorry, I was, I was thinking about something else. I'm just um, like, do you agree? That, I mean, like, how is Beowulf... A hero that we want to model, that our students should model themselves after. I don't think you could leave Grendel's mother as a threat. She she saw it e- easy to murder. She right. didn't give anyone a chance. She didn't come in daylight. She didn't challenge them. She came at night when she could, murdered them while they were sleeping, and like they're not they're not part of the community. I think they're representative of evils. Right. And I was going to bring up. So I used to talk about how. Is, is Beowulf essentially fighting his own culture, right? The love of gold, the love of, mm-hmm. you know, the exclusion of outcasts. And one of my students pointed out that he's kind of fighting the ills of the culture, right? If he fights the dragon, the dragon is re- literally representative of greed right. and money hoarding. If he fights the mother, she is representative of... Vengeance. Vengeance, or especially misplaced vengeance. Yeah. And then if he's fighting Grendel, it is the tendency of the outcast to hate, of, to hate the community. Right, he is in a way fighting the ills of his culture, and I think again, like we are stepping too far outside of the tale that was probably intended by the original poet. But that would be my interpretation, right? He is the picture of a good king. He gives to his men. He never backs down from a fight. He protects the people, and he leaves them well off when he dies, right? And he never seems prideful either, right? He never challenges people needlessly. He comes back at Unferth when Unferth challenges him, but that's it. And it was Unferth that gave him the sword that didn't work. Yeah, well, I mean, mm-hmm. when that, mm-hmm. not unintentionally, and yeah. he actually, when he gave it back, he said he he laid no blame on it. He's like, hey, here's hunting. It sucked. It was a good sword. <laughs> it's not your fault. Yeah, <laughs> zero out of five stars. Yeah, yeah, and and he never even brings up what was said when they were drunk. It says like, how could he remember even what he said in his cups? Sure, like <laughs> you know, poor guy. So. Beowulf, any kids? Did he have a son or anything? No. No? He had to leave everything to... to so does, so does Wiglaf take over? It feels like Wiglaf... It ends, doesn't it? It just ends. It ends with impending doom in the future. And that, I mean... It seems... It feels like a kind of futile tale. Like, he does, he's not leaving his people better off. They're screwed. They have mountains of gold, but they're getting attacked by the Swedes. I don't know. It just sort of sounds like this endless cycle of... Bad thing happens. Of bad thing happens, vengeance, someone's upset about your vengeance, they do another bad thing, and it's just sort of this back and forth. And that probably would have been the culture that they knew. Mm. That's, I mean, that's them. It's a bummer of a song for, like, sitting around (laughs) at a party. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, maybe maybe there was catharsis that came from Mm, it. You'd say these people suffered, 
we are still in that good time with the good king. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we have things threatening us, just like the Swedes were threatening them, yet we can band together. Fair it, point. You don't, it doesn't have to be a good ending all, all the time. That's true. I think, I think you don't necessarily always take a good lesson from a good ending. How do your ninth graders react to this book? Mm -hmm. I mean, part, part of the reason we read it is just because it's just awesome. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> it's not that I'm specifically looking for any moral lessons. We, we compare the warrior culture to the Christian culture, and we, we talk about you know, some of the themes and some of the motifs. But at its bare bones, it's just an adventure tale. Right. Like if you come looking for high poetry, you're probably not going to find it. If you come looking for history, you're not going to find it. It's, so it's this fun. Is, this is like Die Hard. Ooh. Just a good action movie. Kind of, yeah. I mean, if, if he's want somebody to imitate, then sure. And, that, and I know that that's not super interesting for our listeners to like not take away some tale of it, but I wanted to show that Beowulf's not intimidating. Just mm -hmm. read it. It's an adventure tale. Read the Seamus Haney translation, and it's Beowulf just killing stuff. It's, think, it's great. That one's easier to get into than the Tolkien one? For sure. It's not as beautiful. The, the stuff I read from Tolkien, is it's gorgeous, but it's far easier to just read the tale in the Seamus Haney version. And I know there's probably some professors out there who are like, he's not pulling the best stuff out of the tale, but I mean... When you're a ninth grade boy, what you want to hear is dudes killing stuff with swords, and this delivers. This is why all the ninth grade girls, when they get into my <laughs> class in tenth grade, and we read like Romeo and Juliet and and uh, romantic poetry, they're like, "Oh, finally, no more bloodshed and <laughs> arms getting ripped off." <laughs> and if I'm honest, I, I pay, put it on the ninth graders like it's their problem. I love this book too. It's just <laughs> like a dude killing stuff with swords. What's not to like? Fair point. Did you yeah. ever read the Tolkien version with the ninth graders or has it always been the Seamus Haney one? I've read, I read snippets with them to clarify some things and to show them beautiful language. But I've, I've asked them like, which would you rather have? And I read back to back passages and they say for sure Seamus Haney. Yeah. Just, just because it's a little easier. Tolkien's hard to get through. Yeah. Cool, man. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. That's awesome. Well. If that is, this has been classical stuff <laughs> you should know, talking about Beowulf. Yeah. Um, if you need us to pay a blood price for anything, <laughs> just let us know. Drop us a uh, line at classical stuff at Wouldn't that mean we do murder first? I'm pretty sure that's what that means. Oh, no, I thought it meant like. Uh, oh, well, it's to make up for the murder. No, yeah, we make up oh. for murder. Okay. We pay, so, yes, we've done no, murder. No, 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 no. We pay something. We give them like. It's like Rothgar. Rothgar did Oh, if you want to. If you've necklaces. murdered somebody. Yeah. If you've murdered someone and you need <laughs> yeah. us to do you a solid. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. yeah. And because, uh, you know, Rothgar did that and it worked out for Rothgar in the end. So I feel like if, Is that we, your can, from this if book? we can give away a couple of gold necklaces to yeah. uh, people that, you know, need some pay some blood prices, I feel like this is a it's solid kind of investment duty. for the future. Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't know how that would go in court if the judge calls you up as a witness and they're like, so what's your involvement in this? Oh, I gave someone some golden necklaces. <laughs> Tried to take care of this. No, we're trying to nip it in the bud. We're trying to keep the bloodshed from continuing by oh. saying, here's some money, give it to the person that you killed, dealt with. and then it's dealt with. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I feel like we're doing a solid uh, to the community. Anyway, uh, you can email us at classicalstuff uh, at veritasacademy.net, and it is to my great shame that we have a classical stuff we got wrong. It's impossible. Megby. What? La you, uh, you, it turns out that you were predictive. Yeah. What did you say was going to be our next classical stuff we got wrong? You know, there were some bold words said about a certain person being uh, of the line of William the Conqueror. And I just had a funny feeling that that person was not actually so descended from William the Conqueror. Catherine Ball has informed us that she is not a descendant of William the Conqueror, but she's a descendant what she, what of... What she was is a descendant of his confectionery, right? He made sweets for William the Conqueror? Or he, he, or he like was a shoemaker or... Uh, yeah. He did something. No, yeah. anyway. He made like... I think it was a, it was a sweet maker, yeah, right? Yeah, a sweet maker. Sweet maker. Yeah. For and William the Conqueror. For William the Conqueror. They have, uh, have it on record that William the Conqueror really loved taffy. And uh, that this man made it for yeah. uh, for William. And fought with him and got a castle in Ireland. So, yeah. uh, K-Ball, you are holding out on us with this castle. Yeah, seriously. She um, still owns that castle. The, right? the Castle of Sweets. Castle of Sweets. Yeah. yeah. That's so it. We sh anyway, so turns out that Catherine Ball is not related to William the Conqueror, but is related to William the Conqueror's confectionery. Yeah. So thank you for um, clarifying, so, Catherine. All right. Yeah, glad we could get that right. Excellent. Um, if you want to tweet at us, you can find us on Twitter at Cluskal Stuff at Twitter. No, at, yeah, at Twitter. Um, we, we do this every time. People tweet to us. It's, I appreciate it. If they tweet at Twitter, it's going Audience, to go poorly. we tried to get classical stuff. We did. It was and if taken. you own classical stuff, hey, man, you don't tweet. So let's, uh, you know, 
I'll pay your blood price. <laughs> um, and then, so, so we just implied they're a murderer. Is that, okay, good. Yep. And you can find us at classicalstuff.net where you can uh, uh, listen to the podcast. You can find our podcast on any place that you find awesome podcasts. Turns out there is now a new app called Google, Google Podcasts, which I start use, have started using, and you can it's really awesome. And it like downloads the podcast, and as soon as you listen to it, it'll automatically delete it from your phone like really? two hours later. Because so, Google Play hasn't updated for me. For, do they have a different app now? Yeah, is so I think Google Play is no longer being updated because they haven't updated our last one, and so there's something called Google Podcasts, Okay, and it's awesome. I listened to our last podcast on an airplane with no internet because I downloaded it. Oh, cool. Do you all normally stream it? You don't normally download it? I normally it? stream oh. it, yeah. I stream it. Yeah. Oh, I use Overcast, and it downloads it, and then it'll automatically delete them after you listen also. Yeah. Cool. It's great. Yeah. So thank you for listening. Um, go off. Find some find some friends. Go uh-huh. sit in a, in a meat hall. Tell some stories. Try not to get in a fight. <laughs> well, and, uh, and if you, But if you do, you know. Win the fight. Win the yeah, fight. Yeah, win. Uh, and so yeah, that, that's it from <laughs> classical stuff you should know. This is Graham, AJ, and Magby signing, signing off. off. See Thanks. you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.